Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at an actual CPA simulation. Why do I say actual? Because this simulation was re released by the AI CPA. The AI CPA administered the CPA exam. Specifically, this is a regulation simulation. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,600 plus accounting, auditing, finance, and tax lectures. This is a list of all the courses that I cover. For this session, we will focus on income tax and I do have additional CPA questions about the RAG section. On my website, you'll have additional resources such as PowerPoint slides, true, false, multiple choice, PowerPoint slides, 2000 plus CPA questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at the simulation. And this is what the simulation would look like. Make sure you are familiar with the screens. Uh, make sure you know where to pull the calculator. Here, there's no additional exhibits, so it's pretty straightforward. And uh, the first thing you want to know is what is the simulation is about? So the first thing is what's the big picture? To know what's the big picture, read the instruction. Quest is a calendar year, accrual C corporation engaged in manufacturing. Listed in column A are year two transaction from Quest financial statements and tax record. In column B, enter the amount to reflect on, ske on schedule M1 reconciliation of income loss per books with income per return as an adjustment to calculated federal income tax. Right there. I know what this simulation is about. This simulation is about this simulation is about Schedule M1. So simply put, do you know how to prepare Schedule M1? Now the good news about this schedule is is each each situation is independent. So if you get one wrong, you can get the other one right. So that's that, that, that's a good thing. And the good news is it's about one topic, Schedule M1. Now, Schedule M1, you may see it in the multiple choice here and there as a multiple choice question, but the simulation, they want to see if you really know how to analyze and adjust for Schedule M1. So what I'm trying to say is this. The exam tests you for your knowledge. They don't test you for your memory. They don't care about your memory anymore. So you can no longer memorize multiple choice questions for the exam. You have to understand it because they're gonna give you the information in different format and the simulation is part of it. Each transaction should be considered independently of the others. Enter increase to net income per books as positive, whole values and decrease to net income per books as negative, whole values if the response is zero, enter zero. Okay, so basically, we're starting with year two, net income per books, 632,000. Now, before we start, if you're not sure how to solve this problem, stop right there. Go to my website, go to my YouTube, look up Schedule M1, you know, Google Farhat Schedule M1. I have an explanation, and I believe I have two exercises which are similar to a simulation for Schedule M1. You want to make sure you understand Schedule M1 before you try it. So simply put, here they're giving you information, they're giving you net income per books, and they're giving you additional information. And you need to find out, based on this information, how are you going to adjust federal taxable income? Are you going to add to your federal taxable, federal taxable income to pay more taxes, or are you, are you going to deduct from your federal taxable income, which you'll pay less taxes? So here's what you are giving the first thing. They're telling you maker's depreciation is 224. Now you need to know immediately that maker's depreciation is tax depreciation. Section 179 deduction is 16,000. That's also tax deduction. Book depreciation is 200,000. So what are they telling us here? Here's what they're telling us here. They're telling us, simply put in simple English, I can, I, again, the simulation is a multiple choice. It's in simple English, tax deduction is greater than book deduction. That's all that they're saying. So what adjustments you would need to make? Well, if tax deduction is greater, then I'm going to take more deductions. It means I'm going to reduce my taxable income. And here's what I'm basically saying in simple English. In simple English, my book, my, my, my book deduction is 200,000. It's 200,000. I'm going to, but my tax is my tax. Let me, let me, let me, let me first show you my, your tax deduction. Your tax deduction is 224 plus 16,000. That's how much you would need to take for, this is how much you will need to take as a deduction for, for tax purposes. But you only took 200,000 for book purposes. Why 200,000? Notice here it says 200,000 book 
depreciation. So the difference between 240 and 200,000 is an additional deduction of 40,000. Therefore, I have additional deduction of 40,000. Simply put, your tax deduction, oops, 40, not 400,000. Simply put, your tax deduction is 40,000 more than your book deduction. Now, in the example, they could give you the reverse where the book deduction is higher than the tax deduction then you have to do the opposite so you have to understand how the information is giving usually usually but don't, that's not always the case usually they always tell you tax deduction is greater than book deduction usually usually therefore you need to deduct an additional amount the difference to arrive to your federal taxable income it means you did not have enough deduction in depreciation for tax purposes you need to add an additional forty thousand which is good for the taxpayer that's good okay Quest declared and paid $40,000 cash dividend in June year two and declared a $30,000 cash dividend in December year two, payable in January year three. What do we have to do for Schedule M1? Well, guess what? Easy answer. We don't have to do anything. Dividend don't go on Schedule <clears throat> dividend don't go on schedule m1 so the answer is zero we don't need to make any adjustment to schedule m1 now this adjustment will be on schedule m2 i will if i have to guess and this is just a guess from my end most likely you will not see a simulation about schedule m2 but that's a guess from my end don't take my word for it but that's my guess so dividend is not on schedule m1 number four thirty thousand of cash contribution were paid in year two and 10,000 of charitable contribution approved by the board of directors to qualified organization were accrued at the end of year two and paid on the extended tax return filing date. Okay. Is there an adjustment? No adjustments. Now, obviously, the $30,000 cash contribution, uh, definitely it's going to be deducted because, you know, tax uh, income per book 632, you'd assume it meets the it meets the threshold. So there's no question about the 30,000. We're not being told anything about any phase out now the other 10,000 here and we deducted another 10,000 of charitable contribution approved by the board to qualified organization so, so far so good it approved by the board and it's qualified organization that was accrued at the end of the year so far so good here's the problem paid on the extended tax filing date well remember if you have to if you accrue that you have to pay it within a certain period of time i don't remember the exact date but definitely not on the extended tax return so since you waited too long to pay that you cannot take the deduction for book purposes you took this deduction for ten thousand dollar you took it and make you and made your income 632 but guess what for tax purposes the ten thousand cannot be taken if it cannot be taken it means it has to be added to your federal income tax so you have to add ten thousand dollar to your federal income tax which in turn increase your taxes you have to pay to the irs okay now you cannot take it this year you can take it next year but not for this year okay so you have to add it back and adding back is not good for tax purposes it means i'm gonna have to pay more taxes okay i have a charitable contribution i have my own lecture about this it's quite extensive so you want to make sure you understand how it works in other words the ten thousand dollar i mean it was all, it was good all the way until it was paid on the extended period of time i don't know there's a period of time i don't know if it's two and a half months i believe i don't you know from memory i don't remember but you should know it okay that yeah if, if this is if this is approved to a qualified organization accrued but it has to be paid it did not meet the payment date okay ordinary ordinary gain on the sale of fully depreciated office equipment to a 60 percent shareholder gain for tax purposes uh, eight thousand gain on the books is two thousand now you have to be careful very careful here first of all the gain is to a 60 percent shareholder was which is a related party but guess what it's a gain i don't care we only worry about the loss so if it's a gain for book we only computed two thousand for tax we should compute eight thousand why do we compute the difference because there's a different basis between the book and the tax in other words we already booked two thousand in this amount baked in this amount the remaining we have to book eight therefore the remaining is six simply put we have to increase our taxable income by six thousand which is not good because our tax for tax purposes we have more gains we have total eight two thousand already already baked already factored into the book income we have to factor add another six okay let's take a look at number six 
Gains and losses on sale of investment in public companies recorded for book and tax purposes. May 1st, a loss of 4,000 negative, a gain of 7,000, a loss of 8,000. There are no other assets sales during the year. Okay, so what does that mean? It means as far as, as far as book purposes, as far as book purposes, what does that mean? Let's bring a calculator. So we had a gain of 7,000 minus 4,000 losses minus $8,000 losses. We have in total a loss of 5,000. Now, what did we do with this loss of 5,000? This loss of 5,000 was factored into this 632,000 because we can deduct capital losses as far as we are concerned for financial or gap purposes. So no problem whatsoever. Now, when we wanna go from financial to tax, do, can we take this excess 5,000 of capital losses? Now you need to know the rules. The capital losses, you can only deduct them up to capital gains. Any excess capital losses has to have to be carried. Okay, what does that mean? It means we have to add back $5,000 to taxable income, which is not good. It means we're increasing our taxes. We're increasing our taxes. Uh, ta we're increasing our taxes because we're increasing our taxable income by $5,000. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. So remember the rule. Capital losses for tax purposes, you can only take them up to capital gains. Any excess can be carried forward or backward, but you cannot use them, you cannot deduct them. Let's look at number seven. Ordinary gains and losses on sale of property to a 25% shareholder recorded for books and tax purposes. First of all, this is not a related party, 25% shareholder. Two, those are ordinary gains, ordinary gains, ordinary gains versus number six, capital gains. That, that's what they're trying to test. So on January 15th, you have an ordinary gain of six. May 15th, ordinary loss, ordinary loss of eight, uh, and uh, capital gain of six. And this is what you did for book purposes. And the net effect of these all these figures, which is um, negative 12, uh, plus six plus two. So overall, you have negative four thousand dollar. Negative four thousand dollar. Why? Let me just show you. Just kind of, it, although it's not necessary, but I'm going to show you. So you have a gain of six. Let's clear the tape. You had you had a you had a gain. You had a gain of six thousand. You had a gain of six thousand. You had a loss of four minus four. You had a loss of eight. You have a gain of two. Overall, you have a loss of four thousand. What do you have to do with this loss? Guess what? Guess what? You don't have to do anything with this loss. Why? Because this loss is an ordinary loss. An ordinary loss is deductible. Ordinary loss is deductible for book and tax purposes. It means you don't have to make any adjustment whatsoever. It means you don't have to make any adjustment whatsoever. What does that mean? It means I'm done. It's zero. It's zero. Now, if they ask you compute taxable income, you take 632 minus 40 plus 10 plus 6 plus 5, but they're not asking you. They might ask you to do that, and this will be your taxable income. This is how you go from your book income, 632, to taxable income by netting those amount out. Once again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Simulations are no more than multiple choice questions, long multiple choice questions. Luckily, in this example, each each situation is independent. So if you make one mistake on one scenario, you don't have to make the mistake on the second scenario. This topic is heavily covered on my YouTube as well on my website. But I, and I'm gonna tell you, I'll, I'll bet with you, you will see Schedule M1 either in a, in a simulation or in a multiple choice. Okay, you will see it, you will see it. So you wanna make sure you're familiar with it. Go to my website, subscribe. You're gonna only invest and study once in your lifetime for your CPA exam. Do it right so you can succeed in your career. Good luck.